and welcome to another podcast of Lost But Found. Today we're going to be discussing God and miracles. My name is Brandon, I'm a relatively new Christian, I'm on my journey and here we've got Albert, I'll allow him to introduce himself. Hello, I'm Albert Martin, um, I've been on the road now as a Christian, on the Christian pathway now for uh, what, 56 years, having come to Christ on the 4th of April 1968 at 10 minutes to 10 in the evening and I'm enjoying the journey every single day as um, I have, by the Holy Spirit, his grace and his blessing revealed in my life. So I'm really delighted to be able to join in this podcast and share with Brandon and to share with you if you're engaging today. As I said, today we're going to be discussing God and miracles. So whether you're a believer, you're someone who's seeking faith or you're even a skeptic, you're in the right place, hopefully. Um, hopefully you get some value from this podcast and we can answer some questions or at least lead you to asking more questions. Miracles touch on the extraordinary and remind us of the power and the love of God. So we're going to dive a bit deeper. Question number one, Albert. Okay. Many people hear the word miracle and think of something almost mythical. How would you define a miracle <coughs> around the context of faith? Well, Brandon, the, the, the word miracle is thrown around, isn't it? Um, and it's like everything that people almost say is, oh, that was a miracle. You know, what a miracle that was. Um, without actually even beginning to understand truly what a miracle is. You know, um, a miracle in the biblical sense, and this is obviously what we're talking about when we're on this podcast of Lost But Found, is an event that goes beyond um, natural or scientific explanation. That basically is what a miracle is. It's an act of God, and it is an act of God that reveals his, his love, his compassion, his power, and his presence in a given situation and set of circumstances. It's not about magic, it's not about luck, it's about God, and his intervention in lives in general, reminding us that he is sovereign over all things and that he is truly active in the world today. If I can give you an example of this um, from my own experience of, of when I started to first see and recognise miracles. Um, I was at Bible school uh, this was in 1970, when I was a very young man, I'm 71 now, um, but in 1970, I, after having got the call of God, went to Bible school, a place called the IBTI, the International Bible Training Institute in Burgess Hill. And I was there for two years, and part of the curriculum, part of the training that students had to go through, and there were students from all over the world then, was you had to go out to local churches in various places and you did your quotes, your preaching training. So you were inflicted upon congregations who had these new Bible school students who maybe had not preached much. I had preached quite a bit by then, but I hadn't preached much. And you as a congregation were inflicted with this new student preaching and learning how to preach. And I remember going to um, near Brighton uh, with a really good friend who's been a friend of mine now since Bible school days called Beauvoir Galanti, who's a pastor in um, Liège in Belgium, a big church there. And uh, we went out together. He's a Ukrainian by descent, uh, but lives in Belgium. And uh, we went to this church and um, I was preaching. And uh, after the preach, I made an appeal to the congregation to respond to what was said, either to take Christ as their saviour, or if they were in physical need of healing, to come out. The Bible says that these signs shall follow them that believe, they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. I'm a Bible school student, really enthusiastic, believing what the Bible has to say and putting it into practice. And so I said to the congregation, this is what the Bible says. And if you want to discover healing for your own body, then I call you forward and let's pray for you. And um, this man came forward 
and he was almost totally deaf, had really slight hearing in his ears, um, and laid hands on him in light of what the scripture says. And these aren't magic hands, by the way. There's nothing specially magical about these hands, um, and there's nothing magical or special about me as far as healing is concerned. I'm not a healer. Um, there are people out there who claim to be healers. Uh, I'm not a healer, but I do believe that God sends gifts from heaven as gifts of healings for individuals, and he uses maybe the preacher or somebody who's moving in faith to be like the postman delivering that gift to an individual. And this guy came out, as I said, who had very little hearing at all, laid hands on him, and God restored his healing and uh, his hearing entirely. And he went out of that place completely, if you had vision, 2020, he had 2020 hearing, if you like, if I can put it that way. And that really started, it was a moment that really started to shape my understanding and developing of what I understood of God moving in the miraculous when we step out in faith. So I was watching The Chosen the other day and there was a really interesting scene where one of the disciples of Jesus has a limp or he's got he's got some sort of impediment with he needs walking stick. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how accurate it is, but it could. Yeah. It's not in any of the New Testament Gospels, that's yeah. for sure. Yeah. But yes, so, but this is a movie. Yeah, yeah. So it's a series. They, they stick as close to the Gospels as they can. Um, but he's going out healing people because Jesus sent out his disciples to, to go and preach the Gospel. Uh, mm -hmm. Not when the Gospel didn't exist then, but preach um, the Word of Jesus. Yeah, the good news. Yeah. Um, and he, he's, he's struggling with this question and he says, but Jesus... You haven't healed me. Correct. But you want me to go out and heal other people. And, you know, in this um, series, The Chosen, uh, the, the character playing Jesus um, says to him, uh, how, what, what a glorious story it will be, um, someone with a limb going around and healing people. Mm -hmm. And it will show to them that there's more important things in this world than like what is in this world you know your physical condition mm -hmm. and it's it's the kingdom of heaven yeah um which is quite a um a powerful scene the reason i i i bring that up is does god perform miracles so that we will believe in him well um because it does make people you know yeah, if, yeah. If, if you've got a, if you you know you haven't got the ability to walk um and then all of a sudden you you can walk and other people see it like that that's how you know, that, that's why people were, the, mul the multitudes were following Jesus, because they saw him before a miracle. Absolutely. So they believed in him. Yeah. Okay, so there's a variety of um, aspects as far as answers to that question is concerned. Okay, so why does God perform miracles? He does so for his own glory and his own glory alone. He doesn't do it for the glory of the person praying for somebody. He doesn't do it for the glory of the person healed. He does it simply and wholly for his glory. That's first and foremost why God does miracles. Secondarily, um, God gives miracles into the lives of individuals in order that he might show his compassion, he might show his love, he might show his power, um, he might show his presence, with us at all times, okay? Thirdly, um, when I mentioned that scripture early, that these signs shall follow them that believe, they shall lay your hands on the sick and they shall recover. When that happens, it doesn't always lead to people coming to Christ and knowing him as saviour, okay? However, what it does do, it demonstrates to that individual who is unsaved, not born again, not a member of the body of Christ, it demonstrates to them that God is real, that he is sovereign, and that he is there right now at that moment. But the other side of that coin is for Christians, it encourages their faith because they see the reality of their faith being outworked, they see the reality of Christ living in their lives, they see the reality of the truth of the Bible, the Word of God, 
and in doing so, it strengthens them in their walk of faith. Now, there's a lot of other aspects to it as well, but those really, I would think, are the, the primary reasons for it. And here's a, a really good example. You mentioned the guy in The Chosen. In the New Testament, we get a guy called the Apostle Paul. The word apostle meaning just basically a sent one. And this guy, Paul, he was sent and he was called an apostle. Um, and when he was sent, the Bible seems to indicate that he had very bad eyesight. And three times it says in the New Testament that he prayed to God and said to God, and remember, he was a, a phenomenal disciple, establishing churches all over the show. Uh, miracles were being wrought, etc., etc. And there is this guy. He's saying to God, who has called him and chosen him and sent him out, will you heal me? Three times he asks and God says to him, my grace is sufficient for you. So you're talking about the thorn in his... A thorn in his flesh, as it's called. Yeah, yes. and that was his eyesight. People think it's his okay. eyesight. There are varying ideas about the, what the thorn in the flesh is. Um, I've got some ideas about that, but not for this podcast. Um, but the general view is that he had really bad eyesight. Um, and it's backed up by other scriptures where it's indicating that Paul is dictating some of the letters he's sending out to the churches to others to write. Um, because, you know, if he had a parchment and he was writing on it and he couldn't see very well, it would be particularly difficult. But if he dictates under the inspiration of the Spirit of God to another who's then writing it down, then that would seem to indicate the reality of bad eyesight. Yeah. That's, I find that passage very interesting when he, you know, uh, God says my, um, my grace is sufficient because... Pe you know, pe people might ask and be like, okay, so if God, if God loved um, Paul, why did he allow him to, let's say it was bad eyesight, why did he allow him to continue having bad eyesight? Mm -hmm. But then I think, what's the most important thing in this world? It's to be close with God. It is. So, if he, and he, and he's all knowing, so if, you know, I, I, I think if you gave the average human, even a believer, in, and you know, the most faithful believer, if you gave them everything, it's, it would be so easy to them to fall away from God. Absolutely. Because right. just by our nature, we yeah. you know, think, oh, well, I've got yeah. everything now. I, I don't yeah. need God. Yeah. So by giving us, um, you know, for, for Paul, by, say, allowing him to have poor eyesight, it keeps him, um, it keeps him humble. Yeah. And which keeps him close to God. Yeah. And the C.S. Lewis actually had, um, I learned this the other day, one of the best um, uh, definitions of humility. Your Stuart from church had told me. Mm -hmm. He said, humility isn't thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. Yes, so when, absolutely. And when you're humble, you don't think of yourself, but you think of Jesus, yeah. you think of God. Mm. And that's what maybe these thorns in our sides allow us to do. Yeah. It keep us humble, keep us thinking about mm. God, which ultimately is for our, our own good. Yeah. What I would say to that, however, you're absolutely right, but what I'd say to that, however, is that God does not make us sick. He doesn't impose and he doesn't impute illness and sickness to individuals. We become sick and we become ill because of the inherent um, disease that's already in us. Um, you know, we're all going to die one day. Yeah. Um, and From Adam and Eve's decision to rebel against God. Correct. It started then and we've been in a continual state of decay ever since. And disease comes out of that. But God does not make people ill or make them sick. And in fact, um, there is a scripture in the Gospels and it talks about, and the Pharisees, I think it was the Pharisees, not the Sadducees, the Pharisees, a religious group, um, came to Jesus after he'd healed a man of blindness. And um, they were trying to trick Jesus. And they said to Jesus, well, who made this man sick? Was it his parents or was it God? And Jesus answered the question and, and basically told them it was a natural thing that had happened, but for the glory of God, he had healed the man. And that silenced them totally. And we have to acknowledge when it comes to sickness and it comes to healing, whilst 
you know, when I'm in various places and I'm praying for people, I would like out of 50 people who have come forward to be healed, I would love to walk away and say, God, you've healed 50 of them. Like Iron Man. Yeah, I love <laughs> yeah, that but... description you gave, or Iron Man. Or, you know, if, if God gave us the ability to, to heal on command, or yeah. if he gave us his power on command, we'd be like Iron Man fly, like flying around. Oh, yeah, yeah. And we'd become, <laughs> we'd become the focus. We think we're God. Yeah, we think we're God, and we'd become the focus. That's why I said right at the start, nothing magical about these hands, nothing special about me except I'll believe what God has to say and I'll do it. It's all of God in his sovereignty. And, you know, the Bible tells us in Isaiah 55 and verse 9 that God's ways are higher than our ways. Basically meaning that, yeah, we, we'll get some degree of understanding of who God is by reading the word of God, the Bible, uh, by you know, trying to learn what the Word of God says by getting into theology and all that sort of thing. But we'll always be almost like on the first rung of the ladder, no matter how great a theologian we might be, even back to Augustine and Calvin and Luther and all these, you know, early church historians and theologians, really as far as understanding God is concerned, they would have admitted, as we must admit today, we're really only on the first rung of the ladder with one foot still on the ground wanting to get to the next one in trying to understand the ways of God and understand all that the Bible has to tell us. Yeah, I think people can get trapped into trying to understand uh, God entirely. Yeah. When I think the, the foundation of everything should be Christ, Jesus Christ, put your faith in him and that's, that's, that's the foundation. Yeah. You focus on Christ and that's it. And then from that focus on Christ, you can then branch out and try to understand different parts of the yeah. Bible. And so but, we should, of course. Yeah, but don't get distracted. Don't forget where you came from. Forget oh, the focus no, of the Bible. Absolutely. And then get obsessed with this and forget the foundation, which yeah. is Christ. Yeah, and you know, I, I, I would say at that point, because it's, it's, I know it's going off the point of miracles a little bit, but what I would urge um, everybody who's watching this podcast... Um, and I, I urge it all the time with people, is I urge them, don't forget who you were. Because as we progress in the faith, as we get to know more about Jesus, there is, you know, there's that old saying that familiarity breeds contempt. And I'm not saying that when we walk in faith and we become a little bit mature in our, our walk of faith, that we are contemptuous about the things of God. But what we tend to do is we stop remembering who we were before we came to Jesus and before he changed our lives. And what that does is it diminishes our worship. It diminishes our praise. And what it does as well, it diminishes our sense of awe over the mercy of God that's been established in our lives. And I continually remind myself of who I was before I was converted because I want my foundation and my footing to always remain there in my thinking because I then never forget, one, how awesome God was in saving me. No, I didn't deserve it. You know, why on earth would he have chosen me? But he did, you know, and I don't want to forget the awesomeness of that but secondarily, I don't want to forget that it was the good news as well as the bad news of the gospel that brought me to Christ. And that brings an enthusiasm into my walk of faith of sharing with others about Jesus and about the gospel and about the good news plus the bad news that's associated with those that reject Christ. And... You know, OK, I'm an evangelist by calling and you say, well, that's your job, Albert. You should do that. But even if I wasn't an evangelist and before I got my calling by God to be given to the church as an evangelist, I was no more or no less enthusiastic in sharing the good news that I had received and transformed my life with anybody that I could talk to. And I still do it today. And, and you're witness of that, you know, and even at 71 you know, there's um, 
no, I was going to use an expression there. There's still a fire burning in my gut in regard to that. Yeah. So I have a question about miracles. Yeah. So we'll go back to the topic. How do we approach prayer for miracles, especially when we're unsure of the outcome? Well, what we should do is um, we look to God as, you know, we're talking about miracles and we're talking about Christians working in the operation um, context of miracles at work and seeing them. So as Christians, uh, I'll talk about on that level first, as Christians, um, we should assume that God will work miracles. I travel a lot into various parts of the world and one thing that is very, very apparent, and that is that here in our Western civilization, uh, which might be considered to be more intellectual, more, I'm gonna say intelligent, I don't mean it in that sense, but more intellectual, uh, where we have all the medical services around about us, you know, what is the first thing that a lot of Christian believers do? They don't think, God, will you perform a miracle in my life? The first thing they do is they go to the medicine chest. The second thing they do if the, you know, the tablets they take don't work is they go to their doctor. The third thing they do is after the doctor has suggested something, they then go to the hospital and they go around all the worldly aspects of healing for their body. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that all these aspects of public health and... It's very important. They're very, very, very important yeah. and we should not neglect them. But as a child of God, our first and foremost approach should be to go to our Father and say to our Father, God, you are God. If you choose to do so, I would love it if you just metaphorically reach out your hand from heaven, touch me and heal me. But we don't do it so much in the West. But if I go to, and I'll share with you in a few minutes about various miracles I've seen in various countries, but you go to Africa, you go to Kenya, you go to uh, Myanmar um, and various places like that where they don't have all the facilities immediately to hand, nor do they have the money to pay for it. We've got our NHS. They can do nothing but believe God as believers to be healed. And amazingly, they are. Yeah. In regards to asking God, you know, if you get a cold or you get a cough and not asking God to, to heal you, just something, you know, from a personal perspective, and I don't know the answer to this, I'm sort of asking, I don't want a genuine answer, is it feels a bit, I feel like I'm pestering a bit. If I'm honestly like, you know, I get a cold or I get sore shoulder, I'm like, God, can you heal me, can you heal me, can you heal me? Can you just, it seems a bit, you know, it seems a bit, um, I'm trying to find the right word. Like a, like a disrespect for the, for the power of God to ask him for okay, okay. Uh, healing insignificant things. Like, at what point do you go, okay, this is, this is beneath God. Like, I don't know, say you've, I'm being an extremist here. Um, say I've got a, a bruise on my foot that is irritating me every, every now and then. God, please can you heal my, heal my bruise? Do, do you see what I mean? I do, entirely. Let's talk about relationship, okay, in light of what you've yeah. said, okay. Yeah, God is God. He is almighty, he is sovereign, he's awesome, glorious, all of the um, things that we could say about him, yeah. Um, and that is who he is. Um, and we are who we are, okay. However, when we come to Christ and we know him as our saviour, we're, quote, born again, yeah, the relationship changes. He still remains God, but what happens is he becomes our father and we become his child. Now, you say, is it beneath him? So if we look at it from a relationship of child and father, if you had a child um, and your child came to you and said, Daddy, Daddy, I've got a bad shoulder. Can you help me? Can you help me? Would you say... Johnny, I'm using a name, yeah. or, or Fred or whatever. Johnny, go away, will you? That's beneath me. I'm 
your father. Yeah. I'm too elevated to be interested in dealing with your shoulder. Will yeah. you just go away? You know, and so if we look at it from that point of view, nothing, child and father, God and son in Christ is beneath him, nor is it considered too small and too insignificant for him to be involved in. Yeah, I mean, if if my... And how does he show that? If I had a, a son in the future and he had, I know, like a very minor cold and he came to me, I'd be like, get with it. Like, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Get it crack on, like, yeah. it's not a big deal. So maybe that's the, the same kind of thing. It is, yeah. I mean, but you wouldn't say to him, crack on, get on with it, and, you know, forget about it. I'm not going to deal with it. If it, was, if it was very minor, if, you know... If well, it, it depends if it takes, on how old the child is, isn't it? Yeah, so I don't know, yeah, say he's 26. Well, if he's 26, you'd say, you'd say to him, will you grow up? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, and, you know, in many respects, the Holy Spirit would say to us, conveying the heart of the Father, if that was our attitude and we were 26 years in the faith, <laughs> and, you know, we're coming to him with a little snivel and say, oh, why don't you do that? He wouldn't reject us, but he might actually say, will you mature? Will you grow up? You know, yeah, I can do it for you. But will you grow up? I think that's what answers the question, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, he, he loves us. And, you know, there is a scripture that says that God loves to give good gifts to his children. Now, you know, children, they run up to their dad, put their arms around his legs and say, Daddy, 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 or Mummy, 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 come to that. And say, will you give me this? Will you give me that? And the child thinks that's a good gift. And they're looking forward to Christmas and getting that good gift that they think is the best ever. But the child, father or mother, may not consider that to be the best gift for the child at that time. And so we need to, recognising his sovereignty as the children of God, recognise that although he loves to give good gifts to his children, that sometimes he'll say no because he recognises that what we consider to be a good gift isn't going to be a good gift from his perspective yeah. for us in our walk of faith. Yeah, I think, I think about it like children as well. Um, you know, if you've, got a, if you've got a son or a daughter and every time you go to the supermarket, they're like, Daddy, Daddy, can I get, some, can I get these sweets? And yeah. every time they go, they want sweets. Yeah. Um, obviously, it's not good for them um, if, you, if they get them every time. But if you say no to them, they might, in their immature state, be like, oh, daddy hates me. Yeah. So, and why, if, if, <clears throat> da if daddy loved me, why wouldn't he give me this? Yeah, yeah. Which is the same kind of thing we do with God. Yeah, um, it is. And that's where good teaching from what the scriptures reveal about who God is and who we are comes into being. Mm -hmm. There is so much around nowadays which are general feel-good stuff that you hear on the internet on youtube and and various places you hear feel good stuff all the time and you know it's society at large it, it, it wants to give feel good stuff to everybody so that they go out of a place feeling oh I'm much better now i feel better now i've been encouraged i've been challenged you know and they go out and they forget what manner of men they are as the bible says they looked in the mirror and they've been given a lot of feel good stuff and they walk out and they forget who they were first when they looked in the mirror. Um, and it's important for us to um, recognise what our relationship is. And it's going to be different. My relationship with God the Father will be different from yours. You know, I've got my own character, my own personality. Um, I've got my uh, background of family and everything that all make me who I am. Um, initially um, and I've been transformed by God's work in my life so I am very different from what I was but there are still those traits there so the way I approach my father God will be different from how you approach him but fortunately he can be a father to all of us in whatever way we need him to be and some people haven't had good fathers and as a result of that, they hold back when you talk about God as a father. But then they need teaching. They need an understanding of, you know, a God who loves and a father who isn't like their natural father, but is a supernatural father. Yeah. Yeah. There was a question that came to mind. Um, 
don't know. I can't remember it though. Um, I'll come back to me in a minute. Okay. One more question about uh, miracles, and then I think you'd like to lead us in prayer today. Oh, to okay. I, I'm, as we're talking about miracles, can I just share for a few moments some of the things that I've seen God do? Of course, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, as the CEO of Worldwide Christian Ministries, I've over the last fourteen years uh, travelled to various parts of the world, sharing the gospel. Um, teaching leaders and ministers, um, helping churches to grow, etc., etc., um, and um, always preaching the gospel wherever I go, good news and bad news, and believing that God can work miracles. And I was in Argentina, and um, I was preaching there. There was a meeting, and, I, and to be honest, I was quite shocked because I didn't realise it was going to be the type of meeting that I was going into, but I walked into this big um hall and there were about 500 people there and all the gangs from the local area and the gang leaders who were drug pushers etc had decided to come to this meeting and I, I walked out ah okay anyway you know they're a group of people like anybody else preach the gospel and uh, when I was making the appeal at the end I happened to look to one side and there was a, a couple standing at one side and this guy had his his, his arm up in a, in a sling with, with, you know, stuff around his wrist. And I just felt God speak to my heart. Go and pray for that young man. So I thought, okay. Um, and so I went over to this couple and I said to the young man, you know, I feel God has spoken to my heart about you and he wants to do something for you. Um, can I ask, what's wrong with your wrist? And he said, oh, a couple of days ago I broke it. And that's why it's all done up like it is. And I said, okay. Um, and this was a test of my faith, I must say. Um, I said, okay, well, God's spoken to my heart to do something for you. Uh, can I pray with you? And he said, yeah, okay. And he wasn't a Christian, remember. This is a, a non-Christian gang member. And he said, yes. And instantly, God healed him. And that instantly. broken bone was restored like nothing had happened at all. And he gave his life to Christ because he saw God's sovereignty at work in his life. In Myanmar, um, uh, there's a thing called a goiter, which is a big growth on the throat. Yeah. yeah? And um, I was preaching the gospel, the usual thing, inviting people to come out for prayer. This guy came out, a Buddhist, came out <clears throat> uh, with this big goiter and I'm amazed he came out for prayer, but he did. And he came out for prayer and I prayed with him and I actually saw the thing shrink. In front of your own eyes? In front of my own eyes, shrink how, and disappear. How, well, completely gone? Completely gone. And how big was it itself? Probably stuck out here. Really? And it whooshed, completely disappeared. Didn't give his life to Christ. Really? Walked away, continued, I guess, to be a Buddhist, but, not, but was, experienced God at work in his life. Okay, in Burundi, where that's I- it, Sorry, that's just incredible. Okay. Yeah. And, 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 and this, you used to be a paramedic, didn't you? So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, th th this is where, like, I think it takes a lot of personal responsibility. And, you know, when we discussed earlier, I mean, it's a completely different topic, it goes deep, but, you know, the, the free wills either accept or reject Christ. Um, if there I, is know, such a thing as free will. Yeah, I know, that's why I said that it goes, it goes a lot yeah. deeper. But you, you've just said you saw, you know, someone's, I can't remember what you called it. Goiter. Goiter, shrink in front of your own eyes and disappear into nothing. You said you've seen that. It's now people, p p people who are listening and, and my own, it's my choice. Okay, do I, do I believe I actually saw that? You know, and yeah. I, I, I do believe you. I, yeah. You know, why, why you've got no reason to lie. You're not like you're trying yeah. to manipulate anyone into believing no, no, God. It's not, absolutely not. Um, so that, and you know, I, if I believe you, which I do, that is a very significant event. <laughs> it's not, it's not a minor event. You no, know, no, it's, not. It's, it's yeah. That is an incredible event. Yeah. And but God does wonderful things. Yeah. 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 So then, you know, that's what's led me to, to believe in God. Um, yeah. And it, you know, I think the same thing happened with the miracles that Jesus performed and the um, the resurrection. Um, you can you can look at a substantial amount of evidence to point in towards Jesus actually resurrecting, yeah. and you can either choose to accept it or yeah, reject it. Absolutely. And either one of those decisions has 
phenomenal oh, consequences yeah. for eternal. eternity. Eternity, yeah. yeah. Eternal consequences. So you've got to think very carefully about yeah. these things. Like, you can't just dismiss them. Yeah. You know, if you're listening to this podcast and, you know, Albus has just described a miracle that he's seen, it should at least prompt you to ask more questions, yeah, look absolutely. at the evidence and come to a decision by yourself. Don't just put me and Albert or, you know, Jesus or Christianity or anyone who follows Jesus into a bubble and be like, everyone in this bubble is nonsense. And mm. just dismiss it all. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Question deep, but look at the evidence. <coughs> yeah. Look at the evidence supporting the resurrection of Christ. Mm -hmm. And if you come to a decision that it's likely Jesus did resurrect from the dead, mm -hmm. you have to assume that Jesus is God and that everything he said was correct. Yeah. And absolutely. that will, should change the way you live your life. Yeah. You mentioned about you can choose to believe what I've said or not. Okay. Again, in Burundi, <clears throat> um, remember, I, 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 I'm not understanding the language, okay, but I've got an interpreter. Again, at the end of the meeting, people came out for prayer. Um, a lady came out for prayer, prayed for her. Um, and the following Sunday, she was stood on the platform, and I said to my friend Sylvester, um, uh, what's she saying? You know, what's this lady talking about? Ah, he said, just to let you know, last week she came out for prayer. And she came out for prayer because she had been diagnosed with an ir um, unoperable um, cancer of the spine. And, you know, there was nothing they could do for her. She was just going to die of that. And she was due to go and see the consultant in the coming week, in this interim week. And she was, she had gone back to the consultant um, and the consultant was baffled, completely baffled, because there was no sign of cancer anymore. And that's what she's standing there testifying of, that God has completely healed her of this terminal cancer of the spine. Now, if somebody didn't believe me, that's fine. Go to Burundi, find the lady. Sylvester will point her out, if he can find her now. Um, and go to consult and ask consult. Yeah. You know, that's the way. This is what I mean by people I'm choosing to believe or not, because, yeah. you know, people who, who don't believe that, there's so many stories of miracles happening. Yeah. I've never personally witnessed a miracle, but I have... Not yet. Not yet. Yeah. But I have had supernatural experiences, dreams, moments in prayer, yeah. that have... I've felt God's presence. Yeah. And yeah. I've, you know, I've just spoken in my dreams where Jesus yeah. has revealed himself yeah. to yeah. me. So that makes me more inclined to believe his miracles. And also, you look at how many miracles there are, you know, you can go online and see so many stories and yeah. testimonies. Yeah. All of, is there one line? Uh, yeah, sure, I understand. Well, see the, the logic I'm going with? I, is I that... do. In light of that, um, my last visit to Burundi, um, which was a year or so ago. Also, there's a, there's a really important point now yeah. I want to bring up after this. Um, yeah, but, yeah. Okay, I was going to say, is I like to test things. Um, and um, made the appeal again in the usual sort of way, and this... There was a whole line of people who had come out and were being prayed for. Um, and you can see the meeting on, on YouTube, on, on, the, on the YouTube channel. But this young lady was there and she had hardly any sight that she came up for prayer wanting God to heal her. So I prayed with her. And um, Sylvester, my friend in, who's interpreting, said, she's telling me that God has healed her. So oh, wonderful, I said, wonderful. Um, however, let's... Just try something here. And so I, I left where she was and went about 15, 10 to 15 metres away and stood on the platform. And then I, I said to the lady, can you see me do this and do that and things like this? And she said, yeah, perfectly, perfectly. So it proved the fact that, you know, she hadn't just come out and was it was a bit of wishful thinking saying, yeah, God has healed me. God's... The reality was that she could see what I was doing from 15 metres away, whereas before it was a bit like, you know, in front of her face. And then it was a bit foggy. Um, and in Kenya, there was a, a lady came out uh, with a severe hip problem. God healed her. Um, in Burundi again, um, you know, we're talking about healing and restoration. Um, the gospel, you know, preached the gospel and made the appeal and people were being prayed for. And I heard this, this commotion going over in the corner. And I said to Sylvester, you know, what's going on over there? Why is there all this commotion? 
and uh, there was this young lady there who was demon possessed and um, there's a group of people around her you know just shouting at her and praying for her etc and I said well let's go and deal with this you know I mean this is an affront to God's sovereignty let's go and deal with it so we went down and um, I just basically said to the young lady and you know I don't see why people have to shout at demons as if they're deaf you know I just said in the name of Jesus be still nothing much happened on that occasion said it again then it started being quieter and then third time it was still and then dealt with the situation the demon was cast out she got filled she gave her life to Christ there and then got filled with the Holy Spirit started to speak in tongues and as far as I know this was in Assemblies of God Church in Burundi um, she then went on to walk in faith so God restored her from this possession um, there was a barren woman and I just heard just about six weeks ago who came out in that same meeting rather the same meeting where the girl with the sight was healed and she came out and the the hospital and the doctors had declared her barren was never going to have a child and she came out and saying you know can you pray that God will give me a child and restore whatever's wrong in my womb and eggs etc so I said yeah okay and so prayed with her and let me re-emphasize here there's nothing magical about me Nothing magical about this hands. I just want to believe God. And just about six weeks ago, um, this is nine months or so gone by, um, I had a message from Sylvester saying, by the way, the lady you prayed for who was barren has now given birth to a child. Mm -hmm. And in my humour, I said, well, if it's a girl, call her Albertina. And if it's a boy, call her Albert. He sent back a little emoji of laughing. Um, finally, in, in Maidstone, and I'm going back now, 14, 20, 25 years ago, um, a, a couple joined the church where I was pastoring and they had a child. Um, they were from a, an Afro um, background and culture and the child had sickle cell disease. And, um, you know, that's one of those diseases that particularly affect that culture. And... Um, Anyway, they asked me to come and pray, and so I went to their home and prayed with them. And um, the doctors then revealed later there was absolutely no sign of sickle cell disease in this young baby. Um, so God had healed. Yeah. Um, so the reality is that God heals the sick. The reality is that God responds to faith. The, God, uh, the reality is that God is sovereign in all his ways. And the reality is that we as the children of God are simply postmen. Mm. We are DHL, we're Amazon, you know, um, we're every, as far as the delivery of things to people is concerned. God decides to give to you, Brandon, a gift for somebody else and you're praying for them that they might be healed. And God says, here, I'm Brandon, here's a gift of healing to pass on to that person. And you're praying with them and God heals them. All you've been is a conduit. That's all you've been, and that's all I've ever been, is a conduit. Yeah. It's also an honour, though. Oh, phenomenal yeah. honour. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It's, I, I understand it's, what you, I, it's I, I, awesome. I understand what you're saying with the, um, the analogy of like, the postman and whatnot. Yeah. But I think that it can sort of downplay the honour that it is. Uh, yeah, okay, okay. It's just... I, God, God doesn't need us to perform these um, miracles. But now he can do it but without he, us. He uses us... Um, it's, you know, a, it's a privilege. There's a wonderful scripture that says we are workers together with God. And you know, in one of our previous podcasts, we asked the question, does God need us to pray? Of course he doesn't. He can do whatever he wants, but he wants us to be involved in what he is doing. And that's when the Bible says we're workers together with God. We're just interacting with his plans. And yeah. it's the same with healing. So the point I was bringing up earlier that I think is very, very important is that there are lies out there. Oh yeah, well, I've seen it online. Oh, um, I know. And those people, it's a travesty. Jesus, Jesus said those people will face the worst condemnation. Yeah. Uh, the people who, uh, you know, they're using Jesus's name to make a buck and to fill exactly their own to make a buck. They will face the worst condemn condemnation. Yeah. Um, because yeah, uh, people can get put off, understandably, yeah. by seeing these cults online. Yeah. These these fake. 
uh, miracles, fake, um, you know, people, I've seen videos of uh, people in churches, mm. I, I use that because it's not actually a church, you know, casting out demons and the lady or, or man throws himself on, throws themselves on the floor, start having a fit. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's all, you know, and it, conveniently there's camera there. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they're posting it online and, um, yeah, it's, so don't get put off by these, no, no, these fake miracles. And you are all right to have some scepticism about absolutely. things. Absolutely. You should do. You, sh- you should have scepticism when it comes to the supernatural. Yeah. Um, because there are people out there trying to deceive you. There are. And the devil himself wants to use those to bring even more deceit into the thinking of people. Yeah. Um, yeah, so don't, uh, don't stop asking questions and don't stop uh, questioning things. What I would say is bring that same critical thinking to the evidence surrounding Jesus and his resurrection and the gospel. Because that's what I did. And the more I looked into it, the more I found evidence to support yeah. The resurrection of Jesus. Yeah. Um, and no matter what you believe, the last inch is always faith. If you're an atheist, it takes faith. You, you don't know the Big Bang happened. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I in fact do believe the Big Bang happened. Mm. Um, that's no no topic. Mm. Um, but yeah, you, you don't know these things, but you look at the evidence and you make a decision. You which do. is the way, like, I think we discussed this earlier when we was at Cafe Nero. We don't know... And the there sense. are other... We shots. don't know the sun is going to rise tomorrow, <laughs> yeah. but the evidence suggests that it does. Absolutely. So we live our lives out as if it is. We do. Which is the sensible thing to do. Of course it is. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to say that. Don't, you know, beware of yeah. deceivers and lies out there. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to lead us in prayer? Yeah, of course I do. To end uh, yeah. us? Mm. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you today because... The reality of your presence is something we can enjoy. And Lord, Brandon and myself, we really do enjoy the reality of your presence. And our desire through these podcasts that we're doing and through whatever we do for you is that the reality of the presence of God might be experienced by those that we talk to, those that we are involved in those that we are trying to reach with the good news and the bad news of the gospel. And we ask, Heavenly Father, that by the Holy Spirit, you will help us in our endeavour. We pray for those that have watched this podcast, who are believers already, who are just rejoicing over what they've heard. But for those believers who are still inquiring and seeking, and for those who are unbelievers, who are thinking about now things that have been said, and the reality of God in their own lives, we pray that, Spirit of God, you will speak in your unique, individual way to those lives, to those individuals, that they may come into a greater experience of the presence of God and the knowledge of God in their lives, and especially that they might come into an experience of being born again, of knowing Jesus as their saviour, knowing their sins are forgiven, knowing their home is in heaven ahead of them, and knowing that Christ, you will be closer than any brother, sticking with them day in and day out, which is part of our experience in you, Lord Jesus. And so we thank you, Lord, for your glory, for the awesomeness of who you are, for the blessing that you bring upon our lives, and everything that you desire to do. And we give you, really we do, we give you all the glory for everything that that we've experienced in you. And we do so, Father, knowing that we can do it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.